Hi everyone, my name is Simon Goldberg. I just want to introduce the speakers for this evening. Uh, Eliyahu Unger Sargon grew up in an Orthodox Jewish household in Brookline, Massachusetts. When he was 13 years old, Eliyahu's family moved to Israel, where he lived until he was 19 years old. He next enrolled in medical school in the United Kingdom, but three years into his MD degree, Eliyahu decided to abandon medicine and follow his dream of becoming a filmmaker. Eliyahu has since earned two degrees from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, he directed Cut, which is a, a film on circumcision which examines the practice from both an ethical and scientific perspective. Rabbi Shmuley Botech is one of the world's leading relationship experts and values, uh, relationship experts and values and spirituality exponents. With his books having been translated into 17 languages and regular lectures, TV, and radio appearances all over the world. He served as host of the award-winning national TV show, Shalom in the Home on, on TLC. He's also the international best-selling author of 26 books, including Kosher Sex, Kosher Sex, which are published into 20 languages, uh, and is widely regarded as one of the most important relationship books of the past decade. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ellie Younger Sargon, and I'm an independent filmmaker. My first feature-length documentary, Cut, is an exploration of male circumcision and Jewish identity. I made the film because I think that circumcision is a really interesting example of a problem that we don't often discuss openly. Namely, what we, as people who care about living both moral and Jewish lives, are supposed to do when our own ethics conflict with Jewish law. The film will be coming back to New York at the end of September, so if what I say here tonight intrigues you, come up to me afterwards and I'll send you an email with more details about that screening. Infant male circumcision is physically harmful, medically irresponsible, and morally wrong. It is also true that infant circumcision has been a central Jewish practice for thousands of years. I'll come back to the religious side of this issue a little later. But for now, let's focus on the practice divorced from its religious significance. Circumcision is physically harmful because it permanently damages the penis. We now know that the prepuce, or foreskin as it's colloquially known, plays an important role in male sexual experience. In a groundbreaking study published in the British Journal of Urology in 1996, John R. Taylor, a Canadian pathologist, examined the foreskin and discovered a neural structure in its distal ridges that no one had ever seen before. Upon closer examination, the neural structure turned out to be a dense network of sensory nerve endings, the most numerous of which were mechanoreceptors known as Meisner's corpuscles. To get a sense of what Meisner's corpuscles contribute to sensation, we can do a little experiment. Hold up your hand and brush a finger over the back of your hand and the front of your hand. The ticklish sensation that you feel when you brush a finger over the front of your hand is due to the presence of Meisner's corpuscles. There are anywhere from 10 to 20,000 of these nerve endings in the ridged band of the foreskin, making the male foreskin one of the most sensitive parts of the body, right up there with fingertips and lips. Circumcision cuts away the foreskin, and with it, all of the nerve endings of the ridge band, leaving the penis a with a much diminished sensory capacity. But beyond the sensory loss, the circumcised penis also loses its motility. In an intact penis, the foreskin glides back and forth over the corona, or head of the penis. During sexual intercourse, this natural gliding action creates a closed system whereby lubrication is conserved. This, in turn, allows comfortable sex to last longer. Moreover, while circumcised men require artificial lubrication to masturbate, intact men have everything they need ready at hand, so to speak. What I have demonstrated thus far is that in the best case scenario, when there are no further complications whatsoever, circumcision causes physical harm. But infant circumcision is also medically irresponsible. 
because it's an unnecessary surgical practice that puts babies at risk. Ask any immunologist or epidemiologist, and they'll tell you that neonates and the elderly are two of the most vulnerable populations to infectious disease. Artificially creating an open wound on an infant is asking for trouble. Precise statistics on circumcision-related complications are difficult to come by in the United States, but a low estimate is 2%. Complications include hemorrhage, sepsis, and in some instances, even death. In the UK, routine infant circumcision was abandoned shortly after World War II when a comprehensive report found that 16 boys out of every 100,000 were dying of circumcision-related complications annually. A 2002 study published in the Pediatric Infectious Disease Journal looked back at 25 years of data and found that circumcised Israeli boys had much higher rates of urinary tract infections than intact boys in the United States. These infections peaked in the nine days following circumcision. Doctors here in the US tend to minimize the risks, and a 2% complication rate might not seem like a lot. But 1.3 million boys were circumcised in this country last year. That's 26,000 complications last year alone. And every year, some unknown number of boys actually die from circumcision. Reading the news in the United States, you'd be forgiven for believing that the jury is still out on the medical benefits of circumcision. The truth of the matter is that there never should have been a jury to begin with. When considering the practice of female genital cutting, we don't start from a neutral position of, hmm, I wonder whether there are any health benefits to permanently altering the genitals of baby girls. Let's set up some studies and see what kinds of diseases cutting off clitorises can prevent. We don't do this because we understand the very basic concept that cutting away healthy functional tissue in the hopes of preventing potential disease is just bad medicine. In fact, the only people in the world who really seem interested in these endless comparative health benefit assessments are people connected to the US medical establishment and their critics, religious apologists, and documentary filmmakers. When I made my film, I went to three independent experts, two medical doctors and an expert in quantitative analysis. The doctors were people who performed circumcisions regularly, so I wasn't cherry picking them, and the quantitative expert was a disinterested party who was familiar with the data on circumcision. I asked them what they thought about the health benefits of circumcision. None of them were impressed by the modern data, and they all told me that the evidence was flimsy at best. Which brings us to the ethics of infant circumcision. As pre-autonomous beings, infants are unable to make decisions for themselves, and all decisions related to their bodies are made for them by their parents. Everything from how long their hair is worn, to when to cut their nails, to what sort of vaccinations to give them and how to treat their illnesses. These and many other decisions are made by parents on behalf of their pre-autonomous children every day. Some of these decisions are morally neutral, some are right, and some are wrong. We can all agree, for example, that a parent who refuses to provide their child with antibiotics when they have a bacterial infection is making a morally wrong parenting decision. But some parenting decisions are trickier to judge. Does raising a child with the belief that hell is a real place constitute abuse? How about completely isolating a child from the secular world? tricky cases indeed. By contrast, infant circumcision is not a tricky case at all. Is it morally permissible for a parent to permanently alter the body and future sexual experience of their child absent absolute medical necessity? No. A non-life-saving permanent body modification with lifelong consequences is a decision that should be left for a time when the child becomes autonomous and can decide for themselves. Therefore, circumcising male infants is morally wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just argued that infant circumcision is physically harmful, medically irresponsible, and morally wrong. So what do we do? We're Jews, and we have a conflict 
On the one hand, we have the Jewish tradition telling us that we must perform Brit Milah on our eight-day-old sons. On the other hand, we know that the practice of infant circumcision is wrong. As the philosopher Andy Pessin recently argued in the Huffington Post, there are three logical paths you can take when this sort of a conflict of values arises. First, you can simply abandon the religion entirely. Second, you can ignore the ethical problems and get on with practicing your religion in spite of them. And third, you can try to move the religion forward. I've clearly chosen the third option for some reason that I hope to learn tonight Rabbi Boteach has decided to pretend that there is no conflict. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. First thing, I apologize for my laptop being open, but having arrived here late, I did not have an opportunity to print some of the statistics that I quote in some recent articles that I published on the subject. I'm not surprised that Ellie concluded his presentation by asserting that I am engaging in an act of fraudulence and pretension in falsely displaying ethics to be not in conflict with circumcision. By using that line, and by personalizing the debate so early, before I have even had an opportunity to respond, you are seeing a manifestation of what this debate about circumcision really is. It is not a debate about fact. It is not a debate about medical or health benefits. It is quite simply a radical secular assault on faith. It's easy to prove this, unfortunately, because the only reason we're having this debate is that for the first time, a referendum on circumcision has reached a plebiscite in San Francisco. It has actually reached a ballot. We Jews were accustomed to this happening in previous generations in very anti-Semitic countries, and it continues to happen in Europe. We have never been accustomed to seeing it here in the United States. I wanted to debate the actual proponent of the referendum, who I debated on CNN. Uh, he refused, and Ellie got in touch, and thank you very much for being here this evening. I know it wasn't easy to come, and I'm, I'm grateful. But this is what this campaign is about. One of the main proponents of the circumcision ban, this is his cartoon, Foreskin man. I like, I like the way the rabbis look a little bit devilish. One might even say satanic. But the best is where you read the line, where is the child? <laughs> the radical attempt to portray religion as monstrous, barbaric, irrational, inhuman, and of course, the age-old barb opposed to sexuality is so time-worn as to be almost yawn-inducing, but it is making a very strong recurrence in our time. Therefore, I also could have predicted that Ellie would immediately discuss the unfactual argument that circumcision desensitizes the human penis. For the record, let me say that no religion on earth celebrates sexuality more than Judaism. I wrote a book called Kosher Sex. I'm sorry that I cannot go through all of the material now to demonstrate that. But the comparison of circumcision to clitoridectomy is so absurd as to be perverse. Clitoridectomy is designed for one purpose and one purpose only to ensure that a woman never enjoys sex, whereas circumcision is designed for one purpose only, and that is to teach a child, a male child, from the earliest age that his sexuality can be hallowed, sanctified, and consecrated. 
How many more sexual scandals will we read involving men who have never learned that message? Who believe that sexuality ought to be an indulgence? I find it interesting that Ellie celebrates the work of people like Richard Dawkins, or my friend Christopher Hitchens, or Daniel Dennett. Christopher, Richard Dawkins, who I debated in Oxford, doesn't really even believe in human love. For him, sexuality is about the propagation of the species, love being nothing but a trick played upon us by our genes in order to guarantee the widest possible distribution of the gene pool. Sexuality has an almost animalistic characteristic to it. Men are not expected to control themselves, and we dare not even judge their sexual immorality, like betraying the wives to whom they made a commitment because they are not designed to control themselves. Judaism thinks differently. How absurd to argue that circumcision denies sensual sensitivity. I'm not a doctor. I will cite some studies and statistics. Ellie's not a doctor either. But the absurdity of the argument is that you're talking about the one community whose longevity throughout history has been proven because they emphasize loving sexual congress between a man and a woman. You're talking about the one religion that says that a man cannot enjoy sex before if his wife doesn't enjoy it first. You're talking about the, the only religion on earth that made, an ob, made it obligatory upon a man to sexually satisfy his wife. And here we have comparisons between circumcision and clitoridectomies, which, are, which is a barbaric ritual designed to remove any sexual enjoyment or pleasure on the part of a woman. I can't debate whether the foreskin gives you greater se sexual pleasure or not. I have never had one. It's beyond the scope of this debate. Because I do know that men who are circumcised, representing the vast majority of American men, seem to enjoy sex pretty darn well. If there is no great crisis in America among Jewish men who complain, you know, my penis just doesn't feel enough today. If only I had even more sensitivity in that region of my body. It seems to me that the crisis in our culture is precisely the opposite. Men not being able to control their sexuality. And no religion on earth has ever said that it's part of God's covenant. The covenant is on a sexual organ. Talk about being counterintuitive. Every other religion denigrates sexuality. Mary is a virgin who has never had sexual congress. The Catholics believe that even after she had Jesus, she remained a lifelong virgin, which is why they deny that James is the brother of Jesus, although it says it outright in the New Testament. How many other cults had virgin births? Because sexuality was something dirty, something forlorn, something carnal, something animalistic, but not Judaism. What an incredible statement that a religion would say that the covenant of God is found specifically on a man's ability to love and pleasure a woman. So that male sexuality, which has sometimes been so unsanctified, can be raised to a higher plane. We can, if we wish, debate the medical benefits of circumcision this evening. I'm sorry. My own computer is not looking in, sorry. But I've researched this pretty extensively. It's probably more appropriate for true experts to debate this side of the subject. But if you look at the extensive studies that have been published in the British Medical Journal, you will discover that number one, and I remember this headline, I'm sure many of you do, headline of the New York Times a few years ago that was a bombshell. That circumcision, aside from a condom, is the most effective means by which to prevent the transmission of HIV AIDS. We could almost contain the plague of AIDS in Africa, something I saw with my own eyes. And I was in Zimbabwe recently. 22, 23-year-old men, an entire generation wiped out from AIDS. We, I fed, helped to feed, I should say, the Christian relief organization called Rock of Africa, a mud hut village on Thanksgiving Day, 2009. We bought 17 goats, had them slaughtered so they could have meat. And it was all grandparents who were raising these children. 
There was no middle generation. They had all died from HIV AIDS. We could almost contain that plague if those men were circumcised. In fact, my friend Rabbi Yechiel Ekstein, who runs the fellowship of Christians and Jews, wanted to pay for, for rabbis, to, hundreds of them, to go together through Africa circumcising the men in order to contain the plague. Circumcision has been proven as the most effective means by which to stop the transmission of HIV AIDS. In the British Medical Journal reporting that circumcised men are eight times less likely to contract the, effect, the infection. Circumcision removes what are called Langerhans cells that exist in the foreskin. They exist in the foreskin, which makes the foreskin susceptible to HIV. You see, Langerhans cells have special receptors that may grant the virus access into the body. Circumcision also significantly reduces the transmission of other STDs, like genital herpes, syphilis. It reduces the risk of urinary tract infection for men. And men who are circumcised have 100% immunity from contracting penile cancer, which, though rare, is obviously best avoided completely. Male circumcision is especially healthy for women. It significantly reduces the risk of cervical cancer by at least 20% according to the British Medical Journal. Cancer of the cervix in women is due primarily to the human papillomavirus. The virus thrives under and on the foreskin from where it can be transmitted during intercourse. But in the final analysis, ladies and gentlemen, the proof that this entire effort to demonize circumcision is nothing but an attempt to demonize religion at large with anything they can find, is that no one ever came to them complaining, asking them to be advocates. Where are the women who came forward and said, can you please advocate that men stop being circumcised? We don't feel that our husbands are getting enough sexual satisfaction. I will tell you what's destroying marital sex. This is an area where I claim some expertise. I've written many books on the subject. One out of three American marriages is entirely sexless. It was the subject of my book, The Kosher Sutra, which I thought was a national bestseller. The principal reason? Pornography on the internet and masturbation, where men do not feel that their wives are their principal sexual outlet. The denigration of sex so that it's no longer something fascinating and interesting. It's widespread availability in the form of things that, that degrade it so that it loses its mystery. I've debated some of the world's leading relationship experts on these subjects. No one ever said that circumcised men have worse sex. They have said that husbands who lose romantic interest in their wives, or who cheat on their wives, or who make their wives feel unloved, who don't focus on them, that's where sex begins to disappear. So if the, if the opponents of circumcision were truly interested in the sexual vitality of men and women, they would know where to go. They would teach teenagers, and especially young girls, that you have sex at 14 and 15 in order to accommodate some 16-year-old in high school who made you feel like, if you say no, I won't be your boyfriend anymore, that that's not a pleasurable sexual experience. 80% of women, often, they report that their first sexual experience is not pleasurable. It starts to turn them off sex. It's not a loving act. It's about feeling used at times. That's what turns people off of sex. But you don't see them attacking that aspect of the culture the secular aspect of the culture that has demeaned and degraded women, the aspect of the culture that has erased the line that divides the female recording industry legitimately, people like Aretha Franklin, from what has simply become soft porn, beginning with Madonna, continuing with Britney Spears, continuing with Lady Gaga. Did the Beatles need to run around in stiletto heels and tights in order to sell their albums? You show me one woman who, besides Susan Boyle, always used as an example that who actually has a, some flesh on her who can sell an album. <laughs> the disgusting ex sexual exploitation of women, which is part and parcel of a secular culture that sees women's bodies as nothing but the means by which to sell beer during football games. That's what's making <laughs> men disrespect women. We once had a dream, and I'm a feminist. We had a dream. We once had a dream that a woman would be appreciated for her brain and not her bust. There are maybe three or four women in America who are famous for their brains 
Hillary Clinton, Oprah Winfrey, Diane Sawyer, Katie Kirk. You know how many are famous for their bodies? I can't count them all. I have not a lot of that much time in this debate. And if, the, if people really cared about the death of sexuality and how men don't respect women sexually, which is turning women off of sex, because I counsel these people every day, their target would not be religion. It would be radical secularism. Well, I don't really know where to begin. <laughs> um, but may, maybe I should start with um, uh, apologizing for the fact that my name isn't Lloyd Schofield or Matthew Hess. Um, I am not those people, and I'm not here to defend them. I'm here to debate the practice of circumcision. Um, Matthew Hess is the author of the Foreskin Man comic, and Lloyd Schofield is the uh, the proponent for the ballot in San Francisco, the ballot initiative. Um, I'm not them, and I'm not, I don't even know if I'm, my arguments are the exact same arguments that they make. Um, but more to the point, um, let, let, let me try and address a few issues here that I think are, are, are really important to keep straight. First of all, on the issue of male versus female genital cutting, um, it's important to note that there are uh, a variety of uh, female genital cutting practices throughout the world, and there are a variety of male genital cutting practices throughout the world. And they vary in severity. Uh, and I think what the rabbi is making a mistake about here is uh, the rationale for a practice versus the effects of a practice. In other words, um, you know, I could cite to you Jewish sources that claim that the purpose of circumcision is to reduce sexual pleasure, such as the Rambam in Mornavuchim, for example. Um, Gersonides uh, around the same time, most of them are sort of clustered around the medieval period, which is not surprising. Um, but that has to be taken as a separate issue. Why a practice is justified or what reasons are given for a practice as opposed to what the effects of a practice are. And that brings me to another point that I'm a little puzzled by, because if the foreskin is beyond the scope of this debate, then I don't really know what we're talking about anymore. Because circumcision is about cutting away the foreskin. And if you want to know if something is being lost, you need to talk about what the foreskin does for an intact male. So uh, that seems to be a problem right there. Um, I would uh, take you to task on the issue of um, men not complaining about their circumcisions. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of men around the world who have gone through a very a painful process of restoration. That's a that's a, a sort of extreme. That's that's a that's you're so upset about circumcision that you are going to stretch the remnant of your foreskin so that you can feel better about it. And there are hundreds of thousands of men who do that. There are also lots of men who suffer from some of the complications that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the notion that no one complains about circumcision is just patently and demonstrably false. Um, I don't think you have to argue, coming back to the previous point, I don't think you have to argue that Judaism is against sexuality or that Judaism uh, uh, rationalizes the practice of circumcision as a decrease in sexuality um, to decide whether or not this is a harmful practice. And um, I mean, as, as far as you know, <laughs> the evidence for what I was saying about the Meisner's corpuscles in the foreskin. It was discovered by Taylor in the 90s, as I mentioned. It's been reconfirmed by Hyang et al. in 2005, and I'm not making this up. There's a researcher named Dong. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dong et al. in 2007 also confirmed the existence of this high concentration of Meisner's corpuscles in the ridge band of the foreskin. Uh, and it's been neurologically confirmed by Sorrell's et al. in their 2007 BJU study. Um, there's, there's, there were too many health claims for me to go through every single one. We can do that in the Q&A if you'd like. But I, I, I do want to point something out about the history of circumcision as a medical practice in the United States. Um, it has a profile of being a cure in search of a disease. Uh, so if you look back, and it's, it's really interesting also because circumcision proponents often sort of combine this history as, you know, well, we do circumcision because of cervical cancer, because of urinary tract infections, and because of HIV. And, and the truth of the matter is that that actually, you need to, you need to look at the history. Um, every generation uh, since the early 20th century has given a different reason for why circumcision is practiced. 
Um, and another piece of very important evidence is if you look at the number of studies devoted to male genital cutting and its health benefits, so-called, and the number of studies devoted to these, if there are any, uh, health benefits of female genital cutting, you'll understand that this is a cultural practice that the United States is trying to justify over and over and over. Um, so just the historical profile alone is, makes this whole thing very, very suspicious. Um, any other points? Yeah, uh, just on this issue of me celebrating Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, um, I, I assume that that is a reference to a podcast I did a few years back called Holy Atheism. Um, but I'm guessing the rabbi didn't listen to them, the episodes, because I was very critical of all of those thinkers in my podcast and in the reading groups. And there's someone here who was a part of those reading groups who can testify to that. So thank you. Thank you. The very first act of corruption of mankind took place through a corruption of language. When the serpent says to Eve, my, isn't that a good fruit? Not a luscious fruit, not a delectable fruit, but a good fruit. He discombobulates her through a corruption of language. A fruit can be tasty or tasteless, but moral terms do not apply to it. You will notice that whenever, very often when people make an assault against religion, they employ the same corruption of language. What Elliot would have us believe is a circular argument based on that corruption of language. For him, circumcision is automatically a form of genital mutilation, genital cutting. Once he's embedded that, that phrase in your mind, he then can extend it and say, should a parent be allowed to engage in an act of mutilation? I could attempt the same thing. I could tell you that piercing a little baby girl's ears is an act of mutilation. And once I have you accept that, then we can extend it to say, who am I to make that decision? Now, of course, I'm not making the comparison between the two, other than to say, the only time we can question whether a parent can make that decision is once we accept it's a form of cutting and mutilation. What do you really believe has a bigger impact on a child's mental and psychological stability? Whether his parents are married or divorced, or whether he's circumcised. I have counseled thousands of people in my time. I have yet to meet one of these legions of men who seek counseling because they don't have enforcement. I have yet to receive a single phone call or an email from any man who says, I need to see Shmuley, I don't have a force. But I have met many, many men who are deeply psychologically scarred by the fact that their parents are not together or are not together when, he, when they grew up. I was one of those children, and I still am. Should we stop parents from divorcing because of the unbelievable trauma which it subject, subjects a child, as has just been proven yet again in a landmark study published two weeks ago that grabbed headlines. Should we stop women from adopting, knowing full well that these days, almost the majority, and this is not scientific, but I can only say from my experience, children that are adopted later, and this didn't happen a few decades ago, they're all seeking their biological parents. How traumatic is that to discover that Mom and dad are not exactly mom and dad. That's a pretty big decision. Should we stop adoption? I would say that's a more serious decision than whether or not you're going to circumcise a boy. I would even say that the decision as to whether or not to have a child is a bigger decision. Who are we to decide for our children that they should have to live? Do you know life is filled with a lot of pain? Some might even argue it has more pain than pleasure. But sometimes it has more heartbreak than romance, more disappointments than blessings. 
and it always ends in tragedy and death. It's inescapable. Who are we to decide to even have a child in the first place? When I compared you, with all due respect, Ellie, <coughs> to Richard Dawkins, it is not because I believe you endorse his views, but you believe, but you are mouthing his famous critique that ch parents who raise their children in religion are guilty of abuse. He thinks they should even perhaps be prosecuted. It's the same kind of argument. You've made this decision to circumcise your child. Well, let me tell you, I made that decision for three of my sons, and I am absolutely proud of it. When they were born, they were brought into the covenant of Abraham. They were brought into the covenant of the people who believe that sexuality is not something that cannot be controlled. They were brought into the covenant of a people who believe that love involves honorable action, fidelity, and commitment. It is no mystery that Jewish families and communities are so incredibly strong, universally acknowledged as such because of that commitment on the part of men to be domesticated at an early age and to be devoted to one woman, all of which stems from the, the brilliant spiritual psychology of circumcision. That on your male member can be a mitzvah. On the contrary, it is the separation of ethics and sexuality that has led to the morass we are now in. Whether it's books like The Moral Animal that argue that we should no longer be censuring infidelity in marriage because it's absolutely natural. There is nothing more natural. Monogamy is not natural. The New York Times Magazine did a cover story two weeks ago, and I responded, but nothing can boast. I wish I could have responded to the New York Times. One of the most absurd, ridiculous cover stories I've ever seen. The New York Times of a gay sex therapist. Can someone remind me his name? I'm sorry, I, I don't recall his name. Dan, Dan Savage. Dan Savage, thank you very much. Who argues that monogamy should be monogamish. That we should accept that there should be an incomplete commitment to fidelity in marriage because people are always going to cheat a little bit instead of disappointing each other with more stories like Elliot Spitzer or Anthony Weiner. Let's just accept it from the beginning. Fascinating argument. If not for the fact that it's been so repeated and rehearsed that was, again, yawn-inducing. The greatest British thinker, arguably, of the 20th century was Bertrand Russell. He was the world's greatest proponent of open marriages. He and his wife had that agreement. And he wrote his wife long letters about how he would seduce the housekeeper, how he would endlessly unfurl his tongue down her esophagus. He didn't expect any kind of control. And I assume he was not circumcised, not neither of penis nor of heart. But when his wife got pregnant by another man, he quickly divorced her and he said, the expectations I was making of myself did not live up to the kind of natural jealousy that can ensue. You want to try to make to create monogamish? Get the women to agree. Guys are mag B for it. But you get me the women to agree. I was not surprised that it was a man writing a story about a man in that cover story. I am the ear to the wives who live with men with wandering eyes or uncontrollable sexuality, flirting outrageously, even if they don't actually commit adultery. I am the one to whom women come when, they're, when they find a mountain of porn on their husband's laptops. And you know what it makes them feel? Ordinary. Absolutely ordinary. So ordinary that they cannot even sustain the attraction of their own husbands. What it were, the reason why I welcome this evening is it allows us to finally focus on the ethical obligations inherent in circumcision. It cannot be only and simply an empty ritual. A vacuous religious practice. It must remind men of all times of what its purpose is. And for God's sake, if we continue to have more stories like Arnold Schwarzenegger, more stories like Dominic Strauss-Kahn, whatever happened there, 
and more and more women are going to use the four women of sex in the city as role models simply to believe that we can have sex with men. We can long for men, yearn for men, lust for men, but we can never really connect with men because they're on a different wavelength. Because what we're looking for is not what they're looking for. We're looking for one man to place us at the center of his world and make us feel like we are special forever. And he's looking for a woman part-time as a principal partner, but with whom he can fool around and, then, and have others. And women are not going to sign up for that. Let me finally say, my friends, there's a terrible crisis in our culture right now. Women are being weaned off of men. It's never happened before, but it's happening now. One third of women 35 and over are single. They're married to their careers. They find greater satisfaction from their jobs than they do from their relationships. Three quarters of all divorces today are initiated by women, something we never would have expected. Because we've always were led to believe that a woman doesn't want to be alone. That she's prepared to even endure a lonely marriage for the sake of her children, or because, the famous statistic, women 35 and over in America have a greater likelihood, this is Gloria Steinem's statistic, of being in a terror attack than ever finding a husband. And yet they are leaving their husbands in droves because they're tired of the statistics that show that one in four men is a porn addict, defined as looking at porn for an hour a day. This laptop is filled with emails from men who write to me about these problems, asking me how to be with, or the wives. We need to change things. We need to teach men what circumcision means. And it means that your sexuality can be hallowed and sanctified. And I do want to make one challenge to you. Ellie, if you will please forgive me. You said that you know scores and scores of men who have had restorative uh, therapy. Uh, no, no of. OK, you said you know of scores of men. So I have one challenge for you. You did a, you're an expert in this field because you did a documentary on it. I did not. I claim no expertise in this in particular. Sexuality, maybe perhaps more, God willing, I've written many books on that subject. But here's my simple challenge. Please name the URL of the website where these men have gotten together to complain about the fact that they don't have a, a foreskin. www.norm.org, I think it is. N -O -R -M. You think or you know? I don't know if it's org or com, I'm sorry, but if you Google N-O-R-M, you can look it up right now. And how many men are, are on that website complaining they don't have foreskins? There are support groups all over the country. Okay, because I know of virtually every advocacy, ad, advocacy group in the United States. I know people advocate for healthy living, healthier food, against pedophiles, child predators. This has yet, to my knowledge, really, excuse the pun, penetrated <laughs> the media. So if these men really do exist, and they're very tortured by the fact that they don't have a foreskin, my gosh, they're kind of silent about it, or they need a new PR agent. Should I respond to that, or should we go into Q&A? I think we should go to Q&A, and then we can respond to everything. Sure. And tell us who you're asking the question to. I want to, it's slightly off the topic, but Rabbi, you mentioned it. Women are so happy at, not, I don't want to say happy at 35, that they can divorce because they don't need a man to support them. In, in throughout history, women have always needed a man uh, to, for farming and everything else. Now with the, being such a service economy, women have their careers or in such a horrible relationship, they realize, let's get rid of the man so we don't need them. And I want your opinion on that. What we need to understand is the slow transformation from women at, say, 18 or 19 at university, when you would least expect it. We're telling demographers that at rates of 80%, they look forward to being married. There was a big Rutgers University study on marriage. It's a little bit dated right now. It's about 10 years old. But that was one of its major conclusions, that something like 85% of all college-age females look forward to getting married and they look forward to having families. So how do we get from there to this other statistic? That by the time we get 35, one out of three remain single. Three out of four divorces are initiated by women. And they feel almost gratified that they have the financial sustenance not to be dependent on a man. That's fascinating. I agree with you. Many are extreme thrilled that they don't need a man. So we go from this great 
idealism, of love, to cynicism. Now, there may be many factors involved in that gradual transformation. But I believe that principally, and I'm sorry to fault us men, but I include myself in this criticism. I believe it is principally the fault of us men in the culture that is slowly turning women off. They're tired of men who date for sex. They're tired of men who are not as focused. They're tired of men who are commitment folks. My gosh, women were never commitment folks in the past. They're becoming so now. I think even the masculinization of women, something that I have decried in many of my books, is what is happening rather than what I prefer, the feminization of men. I'd like to see a greater domestication of men. One of my issues with the radical secularism that is currently being preached, of which circumcision is only one of its targets, is that it has, it has no noble expectations of men. It essentially, evolution, and I'm not getting into the truthfulness of evolution. You can watch my debates on that subject with some of the world's leading evolutionists. And I claim, again, no great expertise in evolution, although I have studied the subject. But evolution is a philosophy of man as animal. That, that human beings are intelligent primates. And that ethics are superimposed by religion unnaturally. That has been the essence of Ellie's argument. That circumcision is superimposed unnaturally on men who want to enjoy sex more but who are now being forced to do so less. He didn't quite tell us why religion would do this to men. It's another question I'd like to put down. Is it some sinister desire on the part of the rabbis to make sure that nobody enjoys sex? Is it some plan on their part to control people? But again, this tired, old, almost boring argument that religion is there to unnaturally superimpose its morality on who we really are? Is it natural to get up at 7 a.m. and go to a job without an alarm clock? I bet I can prove to you it's not. Is it natural to be hygienic? It's not. Is it natural to be faithful and monogamous? Absolutely not. Is it natural to get charity? It's the most unnatural thing of all. Now, evolutionists are forced to, forced to grapple with these questions. How is it that people can behave altruistically if they have a selfish gene, as Richard Dawkins titled his very famous book, where he does grapple with that. But religion asks us to rise to a higher nature. I actually, let me just finish by saying, I, I even reject those arguments that say that monogamy is not natural for me. That doesn't mean it's easy, but I think it is exactly what they truly want. I have discovered that the men who cheat on their wives do so primarily not for sex. If it's sex and orgasms they want, they can go to prostitutes and they can masturbate. The vast majority of men who cheat on their wives are looking to feel understood. They're broken men and they want to feel validated by another woman. Why can't their own wives validate them? Simple. If you're a broken man who thinks he's a big zero, then the woman stupid enough to be your wife is a bigger loser than even you are. So her validation doesn't count. It's specifically that of the stranger that does. I was not going to respond to anything that wasn't circumcision related, but I can't hold myself back on this one. There's actual uh, evidence that monogamy is not natural, uh, and uh, uh, you can see it in sperm. Um, the majority of spermatozoa in an ejaculate are actually, they act kind of like a football team to block other sperm. Um, and this has been demonstrated over and over. They're called attack sperm. There's some attack sperm. I mean, it's really like a football team. They all have these different roles, but the majority of them, their role is to prevent other sperm from reaching the egg, which is an obvious empirical proof that monogamy is, is not natural. But I, I want to get back to circumcision um, because it's really, uh, I keep getting cast here as like a, a secular, radical secularist, which is really not something that I am at all. And I think it's a little uh, disingenuous. It's a bit of a guilt by association going on by the rabbi. Um, I don't think you have to be a radical secularist to make any of the arguments that I made. You just have to be someone who is able to reason ethically. And I presented my case. Wait, just a moment. Let's take your argument to its logical extreme. Or, I'm sorry, let's take your argument to its logical conclusion. Help me through this so I understand your position. Monogamy is not natural, correct? Although I have to say that was one of the strangest arguments to prove that I've ever heard, but okay. Monogamy is not natural, is that correct? 
Yeah. So who expects it of us then, since it's not natural? Who brought this expectation? I'm not sure I understand what kind of a question okay. you're asking. In our society, if a politician says he's not monogamous, he's finished. John Edwards is done, forever, gone. But he didn't do anything wrong because monogamy is not natural. So who expects this of us men if monogamy is not natural? Oh no, natural? you just made a leap that I, wouldn't, I would never make. The leap being that natural and right are the same things. Oh, I never okay. said that. So let me, okay, so I, let me retrace my steps. Monogamy is not natural, so why don't we simply say that it is an unnatural expectation in the same way circumcision denies men the sexual pleasure you think is their right with a foreskin, I would take it further and say sex with many women will give them even greater sexual pleasure than sex with the same woman even with a foreskin for the duration of their lives. So since you have said it isn't natural, would you tell us that you are prepared to publicly renounce monogamy and say that men should be expected to, f to live by their nature and sleep with as many women as possible? No, because I don't think that that you need to, that's a very strange argument. I don't think that you need to um, make any kind of statement about the morality of monogamy one way or the other when you admit that it's not the natural state of being. In other words, and I don't think that my argument about circumcision has anything to do with nature. It's an ethical argument that's independent of that. But you're not answering the question. I'm directly do answering you your question. That, do you believe that monogamy should continue to prevail in Western culture? Or should we, as Dan Savage says, expect that men are not monogamous and they should be allowed to sleep with many women? It's a separate question that I haven't given enough consideration to really formulate an answer to. You really have never thought about this question? About whether... What, Is there any man here who hasn't thought about this question? About whether or not monogamy should be... It's not something I've given a great deal of thought. It's not a debate on monogamy. Can we go back to what? circumcision? Wait, 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 wait a moment, wait a moment, wait a moment. We now have members of the audience telling us what the debate is about. That's quite interesting. Um, maybe we should take... The maybe we should, if, if one of the... With all due respect, if one of the speakers says, and you said this as a disclaimer, although this is not on the subject of circumcision, I cannot hold myself back, I can't control myself, I have to respond, then so by outrageous. all means... Since you introduce what you admit as a non sequitur, I have every right to respond to that non sequitur. Do you not agree? I think there I are legitimate. I okay, you. so you, you want me to respond directly. I think there are legitimate moral arguments to suggest that monogamy is a good way to live your sexual life, and I think that there are decent arguments on the other side. Let's go on. Yeah. Let me, and let me also say, <laughs> let me also say, see, what's interesting about a comment like that, and I, I don't know which side of the debate you find yourself on, although I might venture a guess. I didn't come here to debate you about no, monogamy. I'm, I'm, no, I'm asking the member of the audience who, who felt the need to be the moderator. Um, <laughs> um, Which one? <laughs> um, what's interesting about that comment is, again, there's, there's the presupposition that circumcision has no moral or ethical framework. I have made the argument that it does. And therefore, since we're not here to talk about its moral and ethical implications, as I said, the sanctification of sexuality, let's only talk about circumcision. This is again a ruse, a trick being played to try and show that circumcision is nothing but an act of cutting. That is where the opponents of circumcision have made headway. They have persuaded us that this has no great moral ramifications, but it does. When we talk about charity, that's not a discussion about money. Charity is a discussion about morality whether the money you make only belongs to you, or whether it also involves social obligations, and the same is true of circumcision. This is not an act of cutting. For us Jews, going back thousands of years, it is about the sanctification of the sexual, something that we need more of in this society. And monogamy is its greatest iter um, uh, expression. The greatest form of sexual morality is to be faithful and monogamous to the person to whom you made that pledge. I, I'm just trying to understand where you're coming from because I, re I really do want to understand what the argument you're making. Are you trying to make the argument that circumcision has positive effects on male sexuality? Like that, that seems to be what you're saying. Is, is that what you're saying? It's just unclear to me. First of all, there's many studies where people say the exact opposite of what you said at the beginning, that a circumcised penis is actually more sensitive because the foreskin is not a very sensitive part of the body. But there's no, since I don't claim any great area of expertise in this, and neither do I believe that you have that area of expertise, while I've acknowledged that 
that argument and disputed it, I'm not going to indulge it. What I will say is that I do believe that men who are monogamous and who try their best to find what I call vertical renewal, vertical sexual renewal with the same woman, meaning instead of just bed hopping and saying, oh, I'm tired of this woman, I'm going to sleep with somebody else, when they really explore a woman's sexual fantasies and her, her erotic nature because they decided, I'm going to find something new here every single day, they have mind-blowing sex. Whereas those who are womanizers are sexual bores who use the same silly sexual repertoire because they've never become sexually imaginative. But what does that have to do with circumcision? It has to do with what circumcision, the direction it points us in, that sexuality is something that could actually be magnified, that it can make us more human. As I said before, the very essence of sex is that we always use it as the famous Zoroastrian divide between mind and matter, body and soul, that sex is something carnal and therefore it cannot be spiritual. That's Circumcision is the fusion of the spiritual and the physical. There's a, I, I mean, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, so I had a question about circumcision. It's, um, Who for? Uh, for the rabbi, I think, probably on this one. But it's, a, it's an ethical question, strictly about circumcision. But it's kind of a serious one. So I just saw in the news this morning that there was a $5 million award for a box circumcision. The kid lost 85% of his glands. Um, how do we reconcile box shops? I know one of your arguments is that circumcision, the average circumcision isn't harmful, which I think people like myself would strongly disagree with. But um, but the boss jobs, we know this happens. If you're, if you're circumcising hundreds of thousands or even millions of boys every year, every single year, kids lose their entire penises, kids die. I mean, this is a tragedy. We know that those people, the, the kid, a boy who grows up without a penis, he cannot have, he can't have sex. He can't have, he can't have a normal sexual relationship. This is a tragedy. How do we reconcile the uh, ethics of circumcision that you've sort of mentioned with this, you know, the fact that we know that these, these kids are losing their, you know, their entire penis. And like I said just this morning, you know, there was a $5 million judgment for this, for this boy. And there will always be errors. There will always be. But if there were no circumcision, there would be no just, errors. Just a moment. But then you deny everything else that I said. You're denying I don't want to focus only on health benefits because I said just, lost his penis just a moment. You asked me a question, you need to let me respond. Unless you want to respond for me, by all means, go ahead. Go ahead, by all means. Thank you. I have made the case of strong scientific evidence that circumcision is highly beneficial for many areas. It's highly whether, whether or not, okay, this, this is the, again, you're, you're making it impossible for me to respond. It's highly disputed. It needs to be said. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. You know, I'll, tell you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. You give the answer because that will make more sense. I will let you have the floor. Go ahead. There's no reason for me to respond. You clearly don't want me to respond. So this isn't a question. It's a statement. And statements can be made. I have no problem with it. Make please let the rabbi respond. No, 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 no. I have attempted to. Go ahead, please. Next question, please. Yeah. I think what I'm trying to understand from uh, the rabbi's point of view is that, especially with the distinction between female and male circumcision, um, you know, in, in cases where female circumcision does not take away all sexual pleasure and that there would be women who still can have G-spot or vaginal or even some clitoral pleasure from sex, even amazing clitoral pleasure from sex, but not as much as she should, she could or would be having because her clitoris was damaged or the outside of the clitoris was damaged depending on the, the female circumcision. So, so is that, is that okay? I, I don't, I mean, it, it seems like your argument is, is that because because male circumcision, you know, because there's still sexual enjoyment, even though there may or may not, there may, the, you know, the, 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 the glands of the penis may have uh, nerve endings, and, and you may not have enough sex, and we, we don't know, although he's presented evidence and you haven't presented evidence, although there may be evidence on your side too, I'm not saying there isn't, but what, if it would be similar in a case of a female, sir, uh, in, in a case of a female, if 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 there she would still have sexual pleasure, but she may not have as much sexual pleasure, is that now okay 
if the reason for circumcision was to for monogamy and, and sexual values and all the, the wonderful things that I think that most of us agree with these uh, values that you're talking about. Well, with all due respect, it's 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 a it's an absurd hypothetical. Um, the removal of the clitoris is designed for one purpose, that is to deny all sexual pleasure. It has no other purpose. There isn't a religion on earth that says that the covenant of God is found in the removal of the clitoris. There are religious extremists, and by the way, even if you want to quote Islam, Islam condemns the practice of female genital mutilation, clitoridectomies, but there are extremists that practice it. And the purpose of practice, again, is what I said before, the Zoroastrian dualism, that the soul cannot exist in extreme carnality. That you cannot have love where there, or, or, or holiness, where there is the physical. So if you deny sexual pleasure and make it more about procreation, and this is where religion has been at times devastatingly uh, harmful to human sexuality, saying that sexuality is for procreation, something that I dismiss, and I can easily rebut in the, in the space of a few, of a few minutes, well, that's what clitoridectomies are about. That is utterly incompatible with the Jewish view of sexuality, which, which is that sexual pleasure is a must. And by the way, let me just say, what you can't reasonably do, I think, is question my central argument that the, that the higher ethical, moral, and, and spiritual purpose of, sex, of, uh, of circumcision is to point men in the direction of the sanctification of the carnal. Because men specifically, because how many female sexual scandals are we seeing in the news? Not a lot. And by the way, there's an overwhelming, although this, this is beyond the scope of this particular debate, there's an overwhelming uh, preponderance of uh, studies and evidence that women who are focused on by their lovers, while women are more sexual than men and they want more and more sex, they want it with the same man. There is, I mean, here's something that Ellie even said before. He said, for, he said that monogamy is not natural. Do you mean, by the way, that monogamy is not natural for women as well? Because evolution. So it is natural. It is natural. Oh, for women? monogamy, sorry. For women. Monogamy? Uh, it, again, you have to define your terms better, but I don't think it's the natural state of human beings. Is it, is it natural, so it's unnatural for men and women? Yeah. Really? Because from an evolutionary perspective, monogamy would be very natural for women because what they want is the fidelity of a spouse in order to raise their offspring. That's the central argument of evolution. Men want the widest possible distribution of their gene pool, and the women want to commit the man to ensure that he raises their offspring. But what is certainly true is just from everyday evidence, we're not seeing a lot of sexual scandals involving women. It's almost as if this message that sex can be raised to a higher plane is something that men need to hear a little bit more than women. I think Rabbi Botech is making the same error again in response to your question of conflating the reasons for prefer performing genital cutting with the effects of genital cutting. The reasons have varied throughout time and history. And I think um, it's very important to familiarize yourself if you're going to talk about female genital cutting with the people who are actually cut. And uh, there are different, there, I mentioned that there are varying degrees of severity, but if you talk to even the women who are pharaonically circumcised, that would be WHO type 3 female circumcision, you will find that they have sexually fulfilled and satisfying lives. Um, Part of the reason is that we now know from uh, 3D uh, ultrasounds that the clitoris is actually much larger than the external clitoris. It has crura, which descend into the labia minora, so it's a much larger organ, and it's not completely excised in many female genital cutting practices. Um, so the notion that um, that you know every, all of the women who are circumcised in Africa are going around, you know, screaming bloody murder. And you know, men in the United States who are circumcised or are not is just patently and demonstrably false. Well, I don't know of a single group, and I, I, until I see one support group, America's a free country. People can lobby for anything. They lobby for the most ridiculous things. I don't know of, and I'm wondering if anyone here knows of, some sort of recognized, a well-known lobbying group for men who feel that they deserve. I'm not talking about some radicals who want to find some excuse. I'm talking about something that really is it, it, some coalition that has formed. But obviously, the best way to determine whether or not people can be sexually stimulated is whether they can achieve orgasm. So let me put this to you, because you did done a documentary about this. Since you said that circumcision um, lessens sexual 
uh, pleasure or sexual sensitivity. Is there any study that shows that circumcised men cannot climax as much as circumcised men? I'm so happy you asked that because there was just a study that came out in Denmark that demonstrated, and this is one of the first population-based studies of its kind, that demonstrated that men who are circumcised after all other factors are controlled for have a harder time reaching orgasm or a higher percentage of them have difficulty reaching orgasm. They also found that in their female partners, dyspanuria, painful sex, was more common after all other uh, factors were controlled for. That came out a couple of weeks ago, so I'm painful so happy sex to raise with it. circumcised men. You know, by the way, a lot of the women might even say that if, if it takes the man a little bit longer to climax, that might be a good thing for a marriage, to be perfectly honest. One of the biggest problems is that men seem to focus so much on their own pleasure and they get there so much more quickly than women. That's an interesting argument to look at, I, I, but I'd have to see the data. Let's take two more questions, please, and then... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a topic that seems like both of you and the audience seem to just kind of hurt all over is medical complications. So I'm wondering, um, within this movement, are there any people, you know, within either end of the movement that are just trying to come up with more procedures and, you know, safeguards so that when a moil does the procedure, when a surgeon does the procedure, that that it's safer, because it seems like that is an underlying concern on all ends. And it, instead of like jumping to just completely end it and, and make it into an ethical battle, what about just streamlining it more and just making sure that there are more safeguards around it? Is well, that, I, I'm not knowledgeable about it, I'm just asking if that's available or if that's... I, I know something about this. Um, actually, a, a really good example, um, and this, Putting aside the ethical issues, you're absolutely right. Complications are a huge thing. And the, the, the study that, the Israeli study that I quoted in my opening statement about urinary tract infections actually came out of a deep concern among Israeli physicians that traditional circumcisions were leading to higher urinary tract infections. That's their hypothesized mechanism for why it is that there's so many more urinary tract infections in circumcised boys in Israel than in the United States. And, um, one of the hypotheses that they put forward was that the method of hemostasis, of um, sort of closing off the wound, uh, was, was the causative factor. That mohels tend to wrap in gauze and that can become uh, resistant to urinary flow which predisposes to urinary tract infections. And then in hospitals, they use a, a very sophisticated kind of gauze that actually uh, melts after a while, uh, thereby alleviating that problem. So yeah, there are people talking about that. Um, there are also people talking about how can we estimate the number of children that die every year from circumcision? It's very, very difficult. Um, and of course, hospitals are not sort of forthcoming with this data. You know, it's, 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 it's amazing. Talk about trying to invent a problem that, thank God, doesn't exist in any kind of large number. You see, in order to use radical secularism to attack religion, you have to invent this problem. How many people here really know of someone, since every, virtually, since 97% of Jewish men are circumcised, how many of you actually know of someone personally who has had an issue with circumcision? I think I know of one, okay, that till today remains a problem. <laughs> how many men do you know? I know a lot, but I'm an activist. Myself is one. Others in this well, room are others. Okay. Um, it would be interesting to see what the exact data is on this. But it seems incredible to me that this is all suddenly coming to the fore when the vast majority of American boys have been circumcised for the longest time. And all these disputes about of the, the medical benefits, some things are beyond dispute. The fact that circumcision, for example, is the best way to prevent the transmission of HIV AIDS has been proof, proven by, according to most journals, conclusively. Would you dispute that? I would. Who says it has not been proven? There, there's a, okay. yeah, so Maria Wauer Just, is the researcher who did the clinical trial in Kenya who proved the 60% infection. This is only female to male. She did another study, it actually increases male to female transmission by 50%. She's on YouTube saying this, so it's not. I would go further than that. I would go further in than a that. a peer-reviewed journal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she's the same, actually the same, one of the authors. Yeah, but I, I'd go further than that. I'd say that um, the whole push 
to use the randomized controlled trials in Africa to justify infant circumcision is completely absurd. The idea of comparing ethically a man who fr freely and willingly subjects himself to a procedure, to forcing a procedure on an infant, is absurd. Uh, I have my own doubts about the randomized control trials that everyone quotes. First of all, talking about it like a vaccine is completely irresponsible. Vaccines provide very high levels of continuous protection, whereas circumcision is going to fail at some point. It is more comparable to the rhythm method of birth control than to a vaccine. So the other, I mean, the obvious problems with the randomized control trials that other people have pointed out is that the circumcised group in those trials uh, were told to abstain from sex six weeks after their circumcision. So they had a six week period of time where they weren't having sex, and that, but the clock started earlier. So you know, they're, 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 those studies are very problematic. Okay. What you see clearly is that the biggest problems affecting us that are reported on every single day, the lack of sexual control, the lack of sexual faithfulness, the incredibly high divorce rate, is something that isn't even mentioned about this potent, powerful message what circumcision represents. And as I said, I find it amazing that the Jewish people who have the greatest longevity of every nation in the world and circumcision has been practiced for 3,000 years that this suddenly is being portrayed as some great crisis in our community. The crisis in our community and the crisis well beyond our community is the desanctification of sexuality. That's becoming a problem that is affecting dating and romance. And you're divorcing circumcision from any kind ethical and moral dimension. Go ahead, let's have the last question, please. Uh, well, first off, the medical part, I almost feel like is a very null point, just in the sense there's so many conflicting things, and also who really was a medical, if, if circumcision in the Jewish realm was a medical, a full medical care, you can see tonsillectomies and appendix, like appendixes being scooped out. I mean, it's just, the, the issue is obviously a, a religious and medical um, issue here. Uh, I think everyone here knows equal parts, people of all religions, circumcised, uncircumcised. And I think I can pretty fairly say for everyone that most of the men are pretty equally scumbags across across all realms. I, I don't think... Um, can you speak up way louder? Then? Sorry. I don't think any of the circumcised men have that much more affinity just through their circumcision alone as a, as a cut to, to have a more sanctified marriage, have, more, have better relationships. Um, what you're talking about more is the whole, is the ethical side of everything. Of teach, like, why, why can't the lessons that you that you portray, which obviously I represented with you for two years, um, why can't that just be taught? Why does it have to also be induced physically to a child at such a young age who may or may not know what that means? Well, first of all, you're right that when it comes to the medical data, you have two camps. One is arguing, and I think if people study this for themselves online, that there's overwhelming evidence that circumcision is a healthier option for men and for women. And you have another camp that is going to look at it very differently, and each is going to accuse the other of cognitive dissonance, that their data is being skewed by the conclusions they've arrived before they even looked at the data. Um, as far as men who are circumcised behaving as poorly as those who are uncircumcised, I fully agree that we cannot lose the ethical and moral dimension of what circumcision is meant to symbolize. When you say, how, we could do it, how can we do it without the confidence being physically on the body? That's the whole point. Prior to Judaism, there was never a belief that sanctity was something that could invade the body. We're the only religion on earth that says that sex is not for procreation. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and leave his mother. He shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The purpose of sex is intimacy. It's not children. As I said, it's easy to prove that simply because women who are pregnant love having sex. That would never happen among, among mammalian primates. In fact, many studies show that women who are pregnant prefer sex when they're pregnant, maybe because of all the hormones that are raging in their bodies, etc. Mm -hmm. um, we know that women who are postmenopausal love sex. Again, if there's appropriate purpose, they wouldn't love sex. There's many other proofs. And the whole novelty of Judaism was its argument that this sanctity could be instilled within the human body. 
that there could, be, there could be a synthesis of the spiritual and the physical within the human body. Unfortunately, like so many other religious practices, they're sometimes done almost as, as a matter of rote, and then they do lose their higher moral and ethical dimension. The whole argument, essentially, that Ellie has made is that circumcision is nothing but a meaningless cut, and it leads to all these complications, so why do it? So you begin with the argument that it's absolutely meaningless, which unfortunately it's become to many people, but to me it's something incredibly meaningful, and that's why it's a religious ceremony. And, and that's why I have spent my entire life writing books about the sanctity of sexuality based on Jewish teachings. My argument all actually... Of which, all of which is symbolized. My argument was by, not by that it was meaningless. I never said that. Violence. I also never called it mutilation, which is something I'd like to correct for the record. I, I'm very careful to use the, the more neutral term cutting, which is just descriptive. So those two things are very important. Um, but I, I have a... And I, I think it's really important to understand also that everything Rabbi Boteach says about relationships and sexuality could be true and circumcision could still be wrong. Those two things are not logically incompatible. But I have a question for the rabbi. This is, this is a question that I think is very important. The majority of American Jews circumcise their babies in the hospital. They don't have a brit milah. My question to you, Rabbi Boteach, is as a rabbi and as someone who cares about the Jewish religion, is it better religiously for a parent to circumcise their child in a hospital, in a medical setting with absolutely no ritual context, or leave that child intact and have them perform a Brit Milan themselves later, which is religiously preferable? I cannot accept the paradigm that you're presenting to me, this either or. What is preferable is for, is for everyone to try to make we never use the word circumcision. We use bris, it means covenant. It's preferable for everyone to try to have its religious significance. It's like asking me whether it's better for people to have totally secular traditions that, are, that look, Jew, that look, that look Jewish-like, let's say like kosher-style restaurants as opposed to really kosher food. In the final analysis, I, I, I reject the choice that I have to make. On the contrary, I believe fully that we are both spiritual and physical beings. I think that bris best captures that. Whatever euphemism you end up using, whether it's genital mutilation, genital cutting, it, it is a manifestation of the same mindset, which is that this is a senseless act of cutting, whereas Jews call it bris milah, the, enter, the entering into the covenant of Abraham. You know, I should mention that Abraham was a tri tribal chieftain, and he had one wife throughout his life, which, was, which just shows how uncommon he was. Even when he finally chooses Hagar, she is imposed upon him by his wife. But the idea of a tribal chieftain back then, I mean, you see the way in many cultures today that are seen as more ancient, how many women and wives a man will have. It's a stunning thing that the Bible describes the very first Jew as having had one wife for the first 90 years of his life. That's just incredible. And maybe that's why we call it the covenant of Abraham, because it is supposed to have that higher relevance, that higher significance. And to the extent that occasionally, very, very occasionally, there are issues, yes, they have to be addressed better. But to say that we should throw out this incredible tradition that has ensured Jewish ethics and Jewish values and Jewish morals that are summed up in that symbol of circumcision because of the occasional error, without excusing it, overlooking it, because it's a very serious thing, is, 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 is absurd. For us, it is the very essence of what we stand for we stand for the opposite of what the world is continuing to believe. And what the New York Times is now saying as well, that men should be allowed to pursue what they want because it's their nature. I disagree. And Ellie, what I find, and I, and I, and I say this uh, with, with respect, the one curious uh, discovery that I have made this evening in this very interesting uh, conversation we've had is that I feel that you have been so narrowly focused on the medical data, et cetera, et cetera, which is all very important, that you have never really given, it seems, a lot of thought to sexuality in general. I mean, you have stated here tonight several times that you haven't even thought about issues like whether women are monogamous and how monogamous men are. Okay, you said that you think that they are, they're not monogamous. Or that whether they're intimacy seekers or some of the other things. I can't separate the two. And to separate the two is to be so myopic, to be so narrow-minded. The bris isn't on the nose. It's not on the eyebrow. 
Jews are not an inner, inner rational, barbaric people that suddenly you can portray us as a barbaric nation so simplistic as to mutilate our children. We are the most, thank God, one, if, if the, if, oh, certainly one of, the most highly developed cultures and civilizations in the history of the world. Where are all the, if circumcision is so barbaric, where are all the complaints from the wives or from the men? There are some experts here who heard that there was a debate and they come with all, armed with all the data. God bless you guys. But I give pu public lectures all the time to many hundreds and thousands of people and I'm, I'm rarely even asked about this question. Now maybe it's gaining steam and it seems it is. And our community I think has, has to begin to take it very seriously. But I don't, do I believe that the motivation is being, is sincere? Maybe Ellie's is. But the motivation certainly of those who've got it on the ballot in San Francisco, there is nothing pure about this motivation. There is nothing noble about this motivation. And if it were a real effort and attempt to really understand sexuality, genital cutting, to use Ellie's words, there'd be a greater focus on sexuality in general. Because I counsel thousands and thousands of couples who are absolutely unhappy with their, with their sex lives. I have written a book that was bought by many people in many countries, in many languages, that try to offer a, a philosophy of sex. I believe I know some of the major problems that are destroying people's sex lives. And not having a foreskin is simply not one of them. Thank you very much. I Should I make a final statement? Yes, please. Um, May I have one? That was mine. We really have to Please, forgive me. There's something very important. Ma'am, with all due respect, it's a quarter to nine. I can address and we have to finish. Have Let's to go, please. To me because they have to feel safe. All right. They have to feel we also safe. have questions. I have questions. Okay. There's a lot of people that have questions. Okay. All right. Um, maybe we'll do this some other time. A lot for further discussion. I'd very much enjoy that. Um, I, for me, the essence of the Jewish tradition, and the reason I'm a proud Jew and I'm able to stand here and say that without any irony, is because the Jewish tradition not only allows, but demands that we ask difficult questions. And it doesn't just demand that we ask difficult questions of ourselves. It demands that we ask difficult questions of the universe, of God, of everything. And the, the person who best represents this idea is ironically the person with whom circumcision started, Abraham, when he said to God, who was about to wipe out Sodom and Amorah, will the judge of the earth not perform justice? And to me, there are many other examples in the Jewish tradition, but it's that dynamic ability to question and grow and move things forward that makes me a proud Jew. Uh, and I hope that tonight you've heard something that maybe will make you think about trying to move this practice forward also. Thank you for coming in. I believe, was it from Chicago? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Thank you for coming in. I greatly appreciate it. And I do hope God willing to, to continue the conversation.